Welcome everybody to North Arkansas College. We are really thrilled to, to see you all here. We're thrilled to have this role in the community. Uh, we're thrilled to carry on John Paul Hammersmith's legacy with this lecture series. And I know y'all didn't come here to hear me speak, so I will turn the mic over to, to John Paul Hammersmith and we'll introduce our speaker. On the outskirts of well. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> they drove down uh, this afternoon from their farm on the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, uh, uh, his hometown, along with uh, my first cousin Bob Hammerschmidt and Bob's wife Melinda. Now I want to be sure and thank Bob for all his effort and dedication, really, in helping to facilitate and arrange for General Ashcroft to be tonight's speaker. Most appreciated. General Ashcroft was born in Chicago, and his family later moved to Springfield, where his father was a minister in an Assemblies of God congregation, and his father served as president of Evangel College from 1958 to 1974, and jointly as president of Central Bible College from 1958 to 1963. General Ashcroft went to Hillcrest High School in Springfield, where he was president of his class, played basketball, and was quarterback and captain of the football team. He earned a scholarship to Yale, a football scholarship, where he, and he graduated from Yale with honors. He then attended the University of Chicago School of Law, where he received his Juris Doctor degree. Following law school, General Ashcroft moved back to Springfield, opened a law practice, and began teaching at Southwest Missouri State University. He then commenced a career of public service that eventually stretched for over 30 years and, by any measure, is truly remarkable and impressive. Here are a few of the highlights. In 1973, at age 30, he served as the State Auditor of Missouri. He then served as an Assistant Attorney General for Missouri. And of interest, during that time, he shared an office with Clarence Thomas, who now sits on our nation's highest court. In 1976, General Ashcroft was elected as Missouri's Attorney General and was re-elected in 1980. In 1984, he was elected Governor of Missouri. He was re-elected Governor in 1988. In 1994, he was elected to the United States Senate. In 2001, 
He became the 70, 79th United States Attorney General under President George W. Bush and served for four years in that position. He was Attorney General on 9-11 and served diligently during a tumultuous time in our nation's history. General Ashcroft currently serves as founder and chairman of the Ashcroft Group and the Ashcroft Law Firm. In addition to his public service, General Ashcroft has been quite prolific as a writer, a composer, and a singer. He has authored books, including Lessons from a Father to His Son, and was co-author with his wife Janet, also an attorney, of two college law textbooks. And these books can be found on Amazon.com, by the way, and, and other places, obviously. He has composed a number of songs, plus he is an accomplished baritone who has long enjoyed inspirational music and singing, including good old quartet singing. General Ashcroft also enjoys playing the piano. In an interview from 2003, when he was the United States Attorney General, he said, quote, I play the piano almost every day because it's a way to express ideas and to experiment. I also play the guitar a little bit and the mandolin a little bit. Music, as I see it, is the study of relationships, tonal relationships, and in all of life, nothing is more important than relationships. General Ashcroft is a member of the Assemblies of God Church. He and his wife, Janet, have three children. His son, Jay, is the Missouri, the Missouri Secretary of State elect. I know absolutely that my father would be ever so pleased and humbled to have General Ashcroft here in Harrison this evening to share with us some insights about the founding principles that have made America great and any other thoughts he believes are relevant. Please welcome John Ashcroft. here to hear it. My dad would have been proud. My mother would have believed every word of it. <laughs> it is an honor for me to be here, and especially given the sponsorship of this opportunity. I know of no person held in higher regard in the United States Congress than John Paul Hammersham. I didn't know him as well as I would like to have known him, but his reputation was without flaw, and his graciousness and kindness never seemed to be exhausted, even in the environment of Washington, which could drain the goodness out of almost any man. He was a constant wellspring of decency and of kindness and goodness, and he was also a Republican, so that's... <laughs> I'm glad for that. And thank you for not saying about the elections I lost. <laughs> you notice know, this, 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 this kindness goes from generation to generation. I lost in 72, I lost again in 74, and I lost the race for the United States Republican chairmanship in 94. And in the, then in the year 2000, I'm the only person in the history of the universe who has lost his Senate seat to a dead opponent. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you're not a humble person to begin with, 
as certainly John Paul Hunterman was. You can get your ego adjusted by losing to a dead man, let me assure you. Matter of fact, politics, some of you may have or may not have ever had a course in political science, but political science is sort of a has it's a roller coaster type situation. I think you could help me communicate this if you would if I tell you a little story. If I say something that's very pleasing, could you just say ah? Let me hear you say ah. Ah. And something that's really pretty bad, would you say ooh? Ooh? I mean, really bad. Ooh. Okay, I had a friend who, was, uh, who fell out of an airplane. But he had a parachute on. But the parachute wouldn't open. But he was headed for a haystack. Haystack had a pitchfork in it. And he missed the pitchfork. He missed the haystack. You know, this is this is the way politics is. This is the way public life is. And uh, so thank you for not including the parts about all the elections I lost. I did have the profound privilege of serving not only people in my home state of Missouri, but people in the United States of America. And America is a unique environment. It is different. It is not like any other place. And most Americans don't aspire that it become like other places. They understand that America has unique characteristics, and some of those characteristics are not accidental. They're not a result of some serendipitous occasion. It just wasn't something stumbled upon. America is what America is because there are core values expressed in the United States from the beginning of this country. If you think even back before the United States became the United States, back in colonial times, there was a singular value which galvanized the people of the United States of America. And the value is one that we're familiar with, at least in name. It's the value of liberty. If I were really just to ask you to start to recite with me one of the most important documents ever written in, in history, we could all do it by saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think the core of American existence is this concept of liberty. Uh, it's true that it's the triad of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but if, if you've got liberty, you're going to have life, and you use liberty to pursue happiness. I think liberty is what it's all about. As a matter of fact, long before the United States became a nation, while it was still a colony, this, this sentiment was expressed with regularity. The people of Virginia were resistant to the taxes of the King of England. And they pushed back against the taxes. When Governor Dunmore of Virginia came to collect the taxes, they said, we have, he'd say, this is for the king. And they would say, well, their, their statement was, we have no king but Jesus. They wanted to indicate that the ultimate authority was not the king of England. They, they repaired to a standard different than that which would be promulgated by any secular government they had. And, and this, this is what permeates our, our, our country's understanding of liberty, that it doesn't come from government. That's why we said endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. And Dunmore got so upset with the individuals who uh, were resisting the payment of taxes and giving him a hard time that he washed his hands of the whole business and he went back to New York. And the Virginians had to develop a sense of what are we going to do, how are we going to govern ourselves, how will we be organized, what structure will somehow shape how we live. And so they met at Williamsburg. And they, they published what I, I, I know as the Virginia Resolves. The first day, they had a statement of the rights of people. And the next day, they had a statement that set a frame of the way they would govern themselves in, in order to protect these rights. And they said explicitly, we are first publishing the rights 
because we don't want anyone to believe that rights come from government, that rights come by the nature of the creation, not by nature of government. Governments are instituted to safeguard and to guarantee rights, but they're not the source of rights. The, the creator of humanity is the source of rights, and that's, that's, that's a, something that we believe from the beginning in our country. And liberty was at the core of that understanding. When the folks in Boston got upset and they tossed the tea out of the ships of the Brits into the harbor, they called those, those people went by the name the Sons of Liberty. They weren't the Sons of Democracy. They weren't the Sons of some other, other idea. It was the Sons of Liberty. And so we get this idea from the, and you know, I think it's pretty easy if you're not careful to forget that in modern times because we don't use the word liberty very much anymore. Our, uh, our politicians too frequently speak to us and cultural leaders and others about democracy. And this sort of struck me not too long ago as I was observing our nation and the way we deal with foreign countries. A new, new regime comes on the scene, say, in the Middle East, and we have to decide how will the United States of America treat that new regime? What level of interest will we express in it? And we have developed a test which I think is sound, it, it, it had a plausibility about it. It sounded good. We always ask them, were you democratically elected? And if they say, yes, we were democratically elected, then the United States has done two things. We recognize them, and then we fund them. And then they do two things. They kill all the Jews, and they run the Christians out of the country. And it's our fault for having the wrong test. We didn't ask about whether or not they would have liberty as a characteristic of the culture which would allow people to be free to realize the potentials that God placed within them, free to worship as they might choose, free not to worship if they didn't choose. We asked them, were they democratically elected? And one of the problems that we have here is that we have confused democracy with liberty. We've, I think the fancy word they're using now in Washington is they're talking about this next administration. We've conflated two terms as if they mean the same thing, but they don't. You see, democracy is not an outcome. Democracy is a process. And you can have a democratic election that institutes an arbitrary, tyrannical rule of a despot who suppresses liberty aggressively. I, I've never met a dictator who didn't have big numbers of democratic support. As a matter of fact, the most vicious dictators have the highest percentage of votes of anybody in the world. They, they can always brag. I, as a young person, not too long after I was playing football in North Arkansas against Fayetteville and, and other schools that were part of the Ozarks Conference, uh, I went to the Soviet Union and, and they had elections there. I was kind of interesting. They only had one person on the ballot and they came away with monumental majorities of voters. Democratically elected, they could swear. But it's important that we understand that democracy is a process, liberty is an outcome. And I submit that the United States of America ought to be interested in outcomes, not just processes. Oh, I am in favor of democracy. Make no mistake about it. I, I kind of like Winston Churchill. He's, you, of course, what's not to like about Winston? This rough old guy, he kind of made Donald Trump look like a wallflower. <laughs> one lady ran up to him one day and said, Churchill, you're drunk. And he said, ma'am, you're up. And he said, <laughs> and he said and I'll be sober in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Churchill put it this way. He said, democracy is the worst form of government ever, ever attempted by man except for everything else we've tried. And that's, you know, it's the best we can do. But it's not an outcome. It's a process. And we respect it as the best process, flawed as it may be, 
But we need to be focused on the outcome. And I submit to you that when we're in foreign settings and we're going to either authorize, uh, recognize, or fund, capitalize uh, a foreign country, we ought to ask them about the outcome, not just about the processes. It may have been that at one time, in our rush to make friends, because we thought the Soviet Union would come in and develop an allegiance with folks if we didn't do it quickly, that we felt like we had to rush to judgment about whether we need to recognize them quickly so we would make their chum up before the Soviets did. But now that we're not so bipolar, I don't mean that in terms of the psychiatric sort of, but, but we're a unipolar world in terms of, we could take our time a little bit and at least begin to signal that we're interested in outcomes, not just process, that we would like liberty. And I think this whole concept of liberty, when it's abandoned, has significant consequences that are adverse to the well-being of the culture. Let me just suggest to you one area where people are so interested in gaining democratic majorities that provide the basis for power have perverted our understanding and our capacity to reinforce liberty. Uh, it's pretty well known in our country that in an effort to get one group or another coalition to be part of your majority, you start to hand out benefits to those people. And as soon as they are recipients of the benefits, they start voting in your direction. You begin to develop a benefit culture rather than a liberty culture. And uh, that in itself is a challenge because uh, people, when they accept the benefits, they begin to accommodate the desires of the bureaucrats who administer the benefits. And, and uh, liberty suffers when people yield their freedom in order to get the benefits. But it, it affects, profoundly affects, a variety of other issues. One of the big issues in America is the issue about immigration. Now, I'm in favor of immigration, and I'm in favor of a lot of them. Three out of four of my grandparents came from overseas. My grandfather was Norwegian to the core, and he was always giving me lessons, you know, how to do things, what to say. Like, you know, he'd say, beyond, he said, I saw this board off four times, and it's still too short. <laughs> if you're a... Uh, Don, you, you know, you ever met my grandfather? He lived in the house on Norton Road when you and I were in high school together in Hillcrest, Missouri, Hillcrest and Springfield. But, you know, uh, if you have a benefit culture instead of a liberty culture, you, uh, you attract a different kind of immigrant. Now, we need immigrants in America in some measure because the women of America are not having enough children to replace our culture and particularly not near enough children to support us geezers who are on Social Security and they need a larger and larger workforce to provide the income that would take care of folks. Uh, so we need not only immigrants, we need immigrants who are productive, who are not here just to consume benefits, but are here to provide the energy and vitality in the economy that will provide a basis for growth. And if people come here for benefits, instead of coming here for liberty, we have a little bit of a problem. Uh, I put it this way, it's important that people come here for free numb, not just for free stuff. Uh, unfortunately, 71% of all the illegal immigrants in America are recipients of government aid. 56% of the legal ones are recipients of of, of government aid, and between 35 and 40 percent of American general is on government aid, and that has consequences. It, my favorite immigrant of all time is Andrew Carnegie. Now, some people were upset about Andrew Carnegie because he was the guy who was kind of rough and tumble in the capital world. He developed a company known as the United States Steel Corporation, U.S. Steel. He came here as a penniless immigrant. I don't think he had two nickels to rub together. Uh, but when he left, he was the richest man in the world. And he gave 90% of everything he earned away. 
And he established, among other things, the Carnegie Foundation. But what is more important than that, 2,500 libraries across the United States of America. I see some of you shaking your head. You went to the library in a Carnegie library, and so did I. I think the last of those libraries built was not too far from here in Marshfield, Missouri. And he came here not for free stuff, he came here for free dumb. And we need to ask ourselves not just whether or not we want immigrants, we're going to have to have immigrants. It's just that simple in order to sustain the culture. It's been part of our growth strategy and part of our prosperity strategy, and it's been part of the fact that it's made America something special all along, but it's important to know what kind of people we're attracting. Yes, we're a magnet. And people want to come here, but let's have them come here for freedom, not just free stuff. One of the reasons we have a constitution is that we really want to protect freedom. We want to protect liberty, this core value of liberty. Uh, Hammerschmidt over here, part of Arkansas, is taking over Missouri. You know, he's up here controlling the banking community in Missouri. I know you've got to send him up here for that. But uh, the most important thing in the bank is not the vault. The most important thing in the bank is what you put in the vault. The most important thing in, is not the Constitution, it's the liberty that the Constitution is designed to protect. But if you really want your stuff to be protected, you have to have a strong vault, and it can't be one that's subject to being pushed around migrated or opened by and added to and under construction all the time. It has to be something that's respected. And so the Constitution of the United States is the safeguard of liberty. And it, you know the Constitution itself wasn't good enough for the founders. The Constitution at the founding simply wouldn't get it done. They demanded that we have something called the Bill of, Bill of Rights that would make sure that no matter how big the majority was, no how, how powerful the democracy or the democracy, however you would want to say it at the time, but sometimes you get a, a mob rule, we have a safeguard against that. It's called the Constitution of the United States. And the first 10 amendments are designed to protect very important and, and, and vital freedoms that I, I think have been mimicked or have been copied in lots of fancy declarations of human rights across across the world in various countries, but never secured with the same kind of durable and lasting and robust protection that the Constitution of the United States provided. It's very important. That, uh, uh, and, and, and the first of these is the right to free speech. And including in the First Amendment is the right to freedom of worship. And I think there are a lot of people in the United States today are wondering about our right to free speech. If people are offended, you know, you're not, you've got to make sure your speech is politically correct so that it's totally inoffensive to people in their campuses around the United States where they have enclaves where people can go and they won't hear anything that's disagreeable to them. Wow. You should come to my house. They get a little training. Disagree. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's very important that the Constitution, and I was stunned in one of the debates recently when they asked candidates, what kind of judges would you support? One of the candidates never mentioned the Constitution at all, just mentioned the social agenda. The Constitution isn't supposed to be the tool in the hand of politicians whereby they can achieve their social agenda. The Constitution is supposed to be a safeguard. It's the vault that protects liberty. It's the referee that keeps things fair and to make sure that things, and so you can't really expect that to happen if the Constitution becomes something that they, you know, it's so appealing when they talk about something being organic. I mean, you know, the organic lettuce is the same price as the other stuff. Let's get the organic stuff because it sounds like that would really be good. Well, I don't know if you want a constitution or a vault that's susceptible to migration, stretching, and has this sort of amoebic capacity to ooze over in a direction to develop something that might be really bad for it. I, 
in America was not founded by individuals who were uncertain about the rights that we're talking about, liberty in particular. I, I was invited to go play golf one time with a bunch of people who wanted to make contributions to the political community and all, and I said, well, I'll go play golf with you. They said, well, we're going to play in St. Andrews, Scotland. You know St. Andrews, Scotland is famous for? It's, it's, the, it's the birthplace of golf. Now, frankly, nothing could turn me off more. I'm not a golfer, and I've, I've tried it, and everything I try to do in golf is wrong. <laughs> I'm standing wrong, I'm holding my hands wrong. I'm did, 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 did. So I get over there and I'm thinking, I'm supposed to be participating in this, but I don't think I would. I think I'm just going to walk around town for a few minutes and see if I can understand something of St. Andrews. And as I was walking around St. Andrews, Scotland, the cobblestone streets, you know, St. Andrews University, I mean, this is a place is steeped with history. I look down on the street and there's an initial there. I mean, it's made out of cobblestones. It may be maybe three or four feet tall, like the letter A or another letter. And I noticed these at various places around town. I asked them, what is it that, uh, what does this mean? Why do we have these initials here? And they said, oh, that's where people were burned at the stake. And all of a sudden, a chill went through except that I felt like I could feel the heat still coming up from the cobblestone. It struck me that there's a certain coefficient of intensity that relates to a person's belief if they're willing to be burned at the stake and not go back on what they believe. Can you imagine being tied to the stake and they ask you, do you recant? And you say no. And then they ask you, as they're stacking the kindling around your feet, do you recant? And you say no, and then they start to pour the oil on the kindling and say, do you recant? And you say no, and they strike the fire to come and let, and you say no. And it suddenly dawned on me, these are the kind of people who decided they would come to the United States of America where they could exercise the things, their beliefs, and, and think in accordance with what they believe God was instructing them to think that, that, you know, all kinds of people will tell you what they believe until your hands are tied, until they're on the stake, until the kindling is stacked, until the fire is struck. But not very many folks are willing to stand there. One of the, according to history, isn't it gruesome? In fact, one guy was, they started burning him at noon and he was finally extinguished at 6 o'clock in the evening. When people have that kind of durable, robust commitment to believe, those are the kinds of people that can make a difference in a community. And those are the kind of people that will have an affection for liberty. It's no wonder. It's no wonder they call themselves the sons of liberty when they were tossing the heat into the tea into the harbor. It's no wonder that liberty is at the core of the value. Freedom, liberty, very important. And I'm afraid we have confused it with democracy. We've come to the conclusion, well, if it was the majority vote, then that means it's free. It's not necessarily so. And the Constitution is a robust set, not only of amendments, but structural requirements that make it difficult for freedoms and liberties to be invaded, disrupted, or displaced. That's why we have three branches of government. Few cultures have three branches. People say it's inefficient. Thank God it's inefficient. If the government is coming to take our freedom, we want a few roadblocks there. We want a few, and, and it was, this was explicit among those who founded the country. They talked about even the one chamber, the, the legislative branch being separated to a House and Senate, and they said it was like, it was like the teacup and the saucer. If the emotions of the people were so hot and the democracy was so intoxicated over an idea that it that it boiled over, that it could cool in the saucer, because we didn't want to rush into things that might invade and disrupt the liberties of the American people. The Constitution, a robust 
and we must safeguard the Constitution, and we must not view it as just another tool to achieve a, various, a variety of social agendas. We must view the Constitution as a framework in which our liberties are protected, and we will only do those things to govern ourselves that are consistent with the Constitution and survive the test of whether or not our liberties are somehow being invaded or disrupted. When Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States, I think it was in about the 1840s. Alan, you may know this better than I do. But uh, he wrote a book called Democracy in America. Ah, sounded good to me. And then I realized he's a Frenchman. And he was saying democracy in America because he was distinguishing democracy in America from democracy in other settings. And he talked about America being great not because our government was great, but because our people were great, because there was goodness in it. We had these values, and these values were expressed so clearly that the people endorsed these values, not just the process of democracy. That wasn't enough. Because with the wrong values, with the wrong outcomes, democracy can be a tool of tyranny as much as it can be an encourager of independence. So the French, as you well know, they didn't send us a statue of democracy. They sent us a statue of liberty because they had seen what happens if democracy gets intoxicated and it becomes democracy. Yeah, we, know, we want it. It's the best we can do, but let's make sure we don't allow it to obscure the main value. They had to invent a new way of killing people over there just to take care of people who didn't fit the majority mold, the guillotine. Off of their heads was the... Boy, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, you know, I was in the Senate, I just love giving speeches. And, you know. When the folks tossed the tea in Boston Harbor, they were upset that their liberties were being and they had a slogan that was, no taxation without representation. You got your well -educated. And they were right. The taxer, King George III, I guess it was, with his velvet slippers in London, he was levying the taxes and spending the money, but no input from the people who were paying the taxes. And a massive gulf separated two constituents. It was the Atlantic Ocean separated. And we were so upset as colonists, we were willing to fight. As a matter of fact, they signed the document saying we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This was a line to be drawn in the sand that we would not accept this kind of abuse of the liberties of the people by someone else without even being consulted. And we all are pretty outraged by that and all of But then all of a sudden it dawns on me, hey, wait a second. Maybe we're guilty of a moral fracture that is more troublesome than that. You see, we've got about 20, 21 trillion dollars in national debt. And I don't think there's a person here that could really stand up and with confidence say that we're going to get it paid. And so we're going to shift that debt down to the next generation or two, or three, or four, or five. And tragically, what we have is taxation. They're going to be taxed to pay our debts. But they won't have any say in it about what we did with the money. And it might be different if we'd been building great things that would last through the generations that they could use. You know, the right kind of infrastructure might be helpful to them. And it might be a decision they'd be happy for. But that's not what's happening to the resource which they are going to have to pay. Because we're not building infrastructure with it, we're just consuming 
in buying additional constituencies in order to reinforce our power in the democracy. And just as several centuries ago there was a displacement of the taxer from the taxpayer and the gulf was geographic, it was the Atlantic Ocean, now there's a displacement from the taxers and spenders and consumers who we are from those generations who will someday have to pay it. And instead of it being a geographic gulf, it is a generational gulf. And that's more morally depraved than a geographic gulf. At least the folks could revolt, could resist, could throw the tea into the harbor. The unborn of America who will have to pay our bills can't throw the tea into the harbor. They have no voice. And America is intoxicated thinking, well, we're voting for this stuff. It's the will of the people. It's democratic. It's just fine. Well, I think it's an affront to liberty in one of the most profound ways, an identical, if not more egregious, affront to liberty than the one which caused this nation to come into existence. And we ought to do something about it as a nation. Liberty is important. It makes the difference. Like I said to Tocqueville, wrote about democracy in America because it was a democracy where liberty had been enshrined. And on the base of that statue from France, the Statue of, statue of Liberty, is the poetry of Emma Lazarus, herself, a family of immigrants from Spain and Portugal, of Iberian Peninsula. And you know the words of it, maybe we learned them in school. I think Don, you and I, we probably recited them when we were at Hillcrest. Give me your tired, your poor, your hulled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. And then what a picture of the statue. I lift my lamp beside the golden pool. Oh, I always love that kind of poetry. Yeah, it just was you know, it was as it was as heartwarming as a country song. And uh one day I thought, wait a second, what did she say? Give me your tired, your poor, your hulled masses, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. Wow. He didn't, didn't have to go to Columbia or Princeton. North Arkansas, Fayetteville, no qualifications. What was the one qualification that Emma taught in that book? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. She understood that liberty and the aspiration for liberty, if that's the reason for people coming, it's, it's, this, it's the catalyst that makes the difference. You know, in the Middle Ages, there were a whole bunch of so-called scientists running around trying to make gold out of uh, base metal. That's what they call those guys, alchemists, I think was the name. And we find out you can't do that. You know, there's just no way to make gold out of base metal. We learned that in seventh grade with that periodic table up there on the chart with all the fundamental elements. But there is a way to make world beaters out of the tired, the poor, the healthy masses, and that's in the context and in the framework of liberty, where liberty is respected. And that's the difference in America. If we want to be an exceptional culture, if we want to be a society that, that continues to have an ascending level of opportunity, people came here because they think things would be better and get better, not because America was on its way down on a slippery slope. It'll be because if, if, if we can offer to the next generation something better than that which we have enjoyed, it will be if we enshrine this special pixie dust of history, if you will, that sprinkled in the arena causes ordinary people to be exceptional achievers. That's what we might last point. Boy, I know some of you read the big side you know, I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, not far from here. I mean, you know, this is almost Lapland, where Arkansas laps over into Missouri, Missouri laps over into Arkansas. But I grew up thinking Americans were just better than other people. 
you know, here we are. I thought we invented everything. I've come to find out we did. But the things I thought we invented. I just thought we were better. One day I stopped and looked around and said, how can we be better than other people when, when we are other people? America is other people. We've come from every every place on the globe. And so it's not who we are or the fact that we were in America, it's the condition here. It's the fact, the special condition here is liberty. And we cannot forfeit we not We cannot just conflate the idea of liberty with democracy and expect to have the same blessing bestowed on us that have been bestowed on those who paved the way for us. We're going to have to have a renewed commitment to liberty in order for this nation to survive. I think we need to pray and ask God to inspire us as a nation to devote ourselves to liberty. Because a benefit society is characterized by bureaucracy. And a liberty society is characterized by opportunity. An opportunity is the condition in which people can reach the maximum of the level of greatness that God has placed within them. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to answer any question about any topic you want. Or I'll talk either one. What are your opinions about the outcome of the presidential election? Well, I have two answers. I have a short answer for that. The short answer is, what we learned from this election is that deplorable votes matter. <laughs> and I'm hoping that the outcome of this election is that America will see a, a renewed devotion to two things. Liberty. And something that supports liberty profoundly, and this, was just, this is the second hour of the lecture, which I'm not giving tonight, but it's the rule of law. We have had a serious disrespect for the rule of law in the last eight years, and I think it's come from the top down. I, 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 just, I, don't, I, I don't want to be partisan, but I don't think when this president decided that he needed to uh, amend Obamacare, because it wasn't going as well as he thought. He didn't go back to the to the institution that created it, which was the Congress. He just knew he couldn't put it there and, he, and get everything he wanted. So he just did it on the basis of power rather than on the basis of authority. He had the power to do things, but he didn't have the authority. And when he disagreed with the idea of prosecuting certain kinds of drug use, he simply announced in his Justice Department, hey, we're not going to prosecute this thing. So I'm going to, basically, I'm going to change the law so that we'll have a, a law that's different from the law that had been put in place by Congresses and signed by presidents and had been part of the framework of America. And when he was displeased about the potential of, of illegal, of the way we treated illegal immigrants, and I use that term in substantial, I know it's offensive to people to say illegal immigrants, but that's the word in the statute. He just said, well, I'm amending the law, I'm giving orders that it would be enforced in this way, and that other parts of the law are to be totally ignored. Well, sooner or later, when you signal from the top that the law doesn't apply, it, it, it begins to erode public trust and confidence. And I'm afraid we have a circumstance in the Congress, not in the Congress, maybe it's in the Congress too, in our culture right now, where we have what I would call a lethal sandwich. We have people at the bottom of the law, that, of the culture, that don't believe that the law can protect them. And the people at the top of the culture that don't believe that the law can prosecute them. And when you have this kind of erosion in the trust that people have in the concept of the rule of law, and that it depends on who your friends are, and how you vote, and who you are yourself as to whether or not you're to be prosecuted or protected by the law, that's very, very threatening to a culture. So I would hope that we reinstall respect for liberty 
especially as me. If I could wave a wand and do one thing to save generations to come, it would be to have a balanced budget so that people who are spending money actually have to pay for what they're spending. I just think that's fair. I don't know how I got that crazy idea, but I must have been raised with that if you're going to if you're going to spend it, you ought to raise it. Yes, sir. Uh, whether or not we're an earnings culture or earn was the way things were to be achieved or whether we're an entitlement culture. And when you're an entitlement culture, you don't have to earn. I mean, there's, I mean that's just definition. Entitlement sounds so good to me. You deserve it is one of the phrases that just runs through our culture. You know, you, it's an advertising. When people want you to buy stuff on credit, they say, don't worry about it. You know, whether you got the money you deserve it. So I'm thinking to myself, whoa, would my mother have fun with that? But, you know, so, so here we are. We've got, and we've got this sex situation. Let's get back to your question about narcotics. I think it, it depends on, a lot depends on the, I don't think a culture is going to prosper based on narcotics. Now, this is partly just my personal view. That the idea that I have to corrupt my mental capacity in order to accommodate the circumstances of my life is a very unattractive thing. It's for me to confess my inadequacy to deal with reality. That really is troublesome. And uh, so for that reason, I, I don't do things that alter my... I'm this crazy without alteration. <laughs> I, I, I'm a teetotal. I don't apologize for a good friend of mine, August Bush, who owns the Budweiser Company, he uh, called me and he was very intent that Trump win the election. And he says, if Trump doesn't win this election, John, you're going to have to come have a drink with me. <laughs> I said, August, I don't know what will drive me to drink tonight, too. Now, here's the thing. We have this tension, don't we? This is a profoundly good question. When the states begin saying it's legal, and it's against the federal law, what does this do in terms of our culture and the respect for the rule of law? Now, when I was Attorney General, California passed a, a medical marijuana. You may be for or against it. I don't know. You, and there are reasonable people who are in the, in, in the camp. But it was against the federal law. And I, we confiscated the marijuana, at which time they sued us. And we went all the way to the Supreme Court. The case was argued in the November of my time as Attorney General. It didn't get decided until the next June, so it bears the name of the next Attorney General. It's Gonzalez versus Raich, instead of Ashcroft versus Raich, which it was when it started. But I just, I, I have this great discomfort in thinking that you can have the state law saying it's just wonderful, and the federal law saying, and it's getting, this divide is getting bigger. California, if I'm not mistaken, just passed a statute for recreational marijuana. And we have a little ski house in Colorado, and I went into what I thought was a lumber yard a couple of, uh, in the last year, and I found out it was a big marijuana company. And I quickly went like this. <laughs> you know, uh, so I don't know. This, this administration, under which we currently live, has decided to just just acquiesce. And, and their enforcement is a tough thing. My, my U.S. attorneys came to me when I was Attorney General and said, we're not going to prosecute any marijuana transactions less than 50 kilos. There are just lots of big transactions. We're going to bust all those guys. 
I said, uh, not. So you can concentrate on those, but every once in a while, bust somebody that got five or one. Because we can't advertise that all you have to do is restructure the way you package the stuff, and somehow what has been illegal is now going to be just fine. But we have that kind of tension, and I can't tell you what's going to be done by the next Attorney General. I don't know who the next Attorney General would be. I can tell you what I did as Attorney General, and I, you know, basically, if the Congress wants to step back from maintaining marijuana as a Schedule I controlled substance, then it can. But until the representatives of the people change the law of the United States, I think it's the duty of the duty of the administration, the duty of the Attorney General to enforce it, and it could be a sticky wicket. Ma'am, in the back there. All I know is there any way that you know that we can get rid of the Senate today and have a government in I don't. I, I wish I could tell you that I could explain that. I, I'm afraid that one of the ways we'll handle our debt is to just pin our way out. We'll monetize the debt in one way or another. We'll make money with us. And, and, uh, but we're not doing that right now. Uh, God help us when the rate of interest ascends. Because we're going deeper and deeper into debt, but if we were paying reasonable rates of interest, I'm not talking about Carter rates, I'm not talking about 18 or 19 percent, but if we were paying reasonable rates of interest, it would just make the debt problem monumental. Sir. Yes, sir, if you can tell us about your opinion of the future of the Supreme Court. Well, I think that the, Donald Trump is likely to, to appoint people who have regard for the Constitution. Uh, he named a, a group of people that have reflected that kind of regard when he was in his campaign and he ripped off. To be honest with you, that list was pretty geographically dispersed and all, and sort of like he named people in a variety of jurisdictions. They were all current federal judges. I think they And I think there's some really good people who would be available from outside government right now. I think that there are a couple of things that you would hope for. I would. Now, maybe people. There are people who, you know, Mrs. Clinton has a totally different view of this. Uh, she wants people who believe that the Constitution can be sort of massaged over to cover or to do whatever she wants to have done. And I understand her right to believe that. I don't. And some people think that uh, you need to appoint the right people. That's the first thing. And secondly, you need to appoint people who don't aspire to, quote, grow in office. And growing in office means that you read the New York Times and the Washington Post every week and you start to move toward the things that they say reflect an enlightened view instead of what the Constitution said. It is not unthinkable to ask that the Constitution only be amended in the way that the Constitution says it can be amended, or in the ways. There are two explicit ways. And the idea somehow that, well, the third way is to have judges who decide that the Constitution wasn't written on parchment, but it was written on elastic. And we can stretch it to be whatever we want it to be. I don't think that's, but you know, there are people who have that, and they can say, well, certainly, we would. Uh, we needed to have a lot of these changes. Well, uh, there have been changes, important changes that have been properly made, and some that were made that were reversed. We had a constitutional amendment for prohibition, and then we had a constitutional amendment that said that wasn't such a good idea to try and tell people they couldn't. Drink. They got thirsty during the interval. Like that. <laughs> yes, sir. Is there a kind of two-part question? That's okay. Is there anything you miss about Washington, and is there anything you don't miss about Washington? Well, yeah, I, I miss the bad stuff, I'm glad, and I miss, uh, you know, it's so easy to live in this little corner of the world. I mean, you don't know how blessed you are if you have to live in a lot of other places. Uh, not to speak of foreign countries like Washington. 
No, seriously, this is a wonderful place to buy. You know, when, both when I was governor and when I was attorney general, I had lots of security. I had people post driven around. It's a relief not to have to tell somebody you want to go to the drugstore and wait for them to assemble the armored cars and all that other stuff. Uh, I don't miss the so-called trappings of office. I don't miss the Senate. And I got out of the Senate by the grace of God. Yes, I was beat by a dead guy. You know the story. My home was built in a plane wreck, and they couldn't take his name off the ballot. And it was a pretty substantial outpouring of sin. Well, that's the way I'm explaining it. It's my story. And I'm sticking with it. But, but, you know, since then, the Senate has become a pretty aggressive place. And there are myths about the Senate. You have to act as if you're important when you go home. The truth of the matter is the Senate, you know, it runs on seniority. And uh, I, the way I, I would question, help you understand what that means, it's like the basketball team that played only seniors, no matter how good the juniors, sophomores, and freshmen were. And that's a big vice as far as I'm concerned. You know, any organization that doesn't put its best talent in the place to be most productive is a bad whoops, except maybe the Senate that's the right thing. Because maybe it's good that they're not efficient. Maybe it's good that they don't get much done. You know, some people say the only handout they want is the government hand out of their pocket, but they need it. So they're pleased. So I don't miss much from Washington. And you can get if you if if information is you know, it used to be that you want to go to Washington, you could hear what was going on. God help you if you try to listen to what's going on now. You'd be just inundated with everything. You can get people learn about the stuff before your security. You have an attack somewhere. You're watching it on TV before your security analyst comes in to tell you. So it's uh, information is just available in a way. And I look one way to look at the American culture is that it was a, a significant break from the old world. The old world was a place where the values of the kings and the authorities were imposed on the people. You know, if, if the king became a Catholic, everybody had to become a Catholic. If the king became a Protestant, everybody. You know, this, this the religious wars was. America inverted that. And so America is a place where the values of the people are to be imposed on government, not the values of the government are to be imposed on the people. So when I ask people to go to Washington, it's not for them to learn so much as it is for them to teach. Washington needs to reflect America, at least the best in America. I'm afraid, in some respects, Washington has become a reflection of America, and America is what it ought to be. Which would lead me to lead me to one of the more radical things I would say tonight, and that is, I think America needs a real revival, and it has to be it will have to be a, a level, but it has to have a spiritual and personal level. And maybe this will be the last thing I quote, but and I think you could probably quote this important verse with all oh, goes something like this: Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the and all the couldn't put Humpty. I was really discouraged by that because I know nursery rhymes are true. <laughs> they are. I mean, it wouldn't last so long if they weren't. And then all of a sudden they notice, hey, you got to read this carefully. It doesn't say you can't put the culture together again. It just says all the king's forces and all the king's men, all the government resources won't get this done. Doesn't mean that it's outside the realm of possibility, but it's going to take the people of this country. And maybe some of the things that are happening, a lot of people standing up and saying, whoa, enough. We want a little change in direction here. So all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't, but maybe the people without the king, without the government, can move things in the right direction. I think I was saying I was finished. Uh, does anybody else want to prolong the agony? Mr. Bill White. How do you feel about terminal medicine? <coughs> I'm for. Is that clear No, it won't, it won't. I don't think it's nearly as important as, as uh, balance, but. And I, I've seen term limitations, but you know, I, I had the privilege of serving with Strom Thurmond. I don't even remember Strom Thurmond. He was a right hand man to Moses, I think. <laughs> and 
stop our use of that time limit. I'm for him. And he was, he said, if everybody else was for him. <laughs> but there are pluses and minuses. That's a close debate, but I come down on the plus side of that. Uh, there are two things. One, I think people tend not to think that they can ensconce themselves forever by voting out benefits to various groups that will become a part of their constituency. And number two, in my second term as governor, I'm one of three people in the, in the universe who could never be governor of Missouri. We have a two-term term limitation, and it's a lifetime ban. There's only two other guys other than me that have served two terms. And it really liberates you in your second term. You don't have to think about whether you're running for office or what have you. You're out of it. Uh, probably too liberating for me, because I might have done things that ruined the rest of my career. Are you going to ask a question or are you pointing the finger? It goes off on that. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Fair. I have your comment and your thoughts on what are these people that have lived under the pressure of the electoral college? Is this a possibility? What do you think you guys have to say about that? Well, I think it's a tragedy. You know, all these people who are. I don't think so. I don't think so. Talk about the national crisis. Talk about people rising up and repudiating that. I don't think there's any constituency for disrupting our system. If I could change anything about our system, it would be the way we get candidates, not be the way we do elections. I think a lot of us wonder whether or not we're bringing. One test of a culture is how well does it percolate the best talent to the top. Any culture that keeps the best people down at the bottom and doesn't let them do their job and do their thing, well, it's, you know, it's, I, I hate to be a sports analogy, but you know, you don't let your best guy back. You have a designated hitter and you put somebody else in who's a strikeout king. That doesn't make sense. But I think, you know, the way, I'm not sure we, a lot of people say this out of 300 million people. But you know, I, for me, I had no trouble voting because I felt like it was a clear choice for me. But I would, I would, and then I would wonder whether or not this business about making Iowa and New Hampshire such important places, and I don't think they are very reflective of the nation as a whole. And I have a little too much influence there. I wouldn't, when I was running for president back in the mid '90s, I didn't tell that to people in Iowa. Or New Hampshire. <laughs> I didn't run very long. Don. Can you give us a little insight about what was going on in my You were there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was there. Uh, you know, I was flying over to uh, Milwaukee that morning with a group of, I always tried to put extra people on the plane, because if you take the plane anyhow, I'll give the people the experience. And the president had. He was down in Florida reading to school children. This is the most innocent sort of thing, very important thing to emphasize literacy in the culture. If people can't read, they're not going to be good citizens and vote. And that sort of thing. I was on my way into, into Milwaukee, and I got the word when I was between. I was looking out the right side of the plane to see Kalamazoo, out the left side of the plane to see Grand Rapids over Michigan. What's happening? I was, and the, they barked back into the cabin, called the command center, and I all the command center. I learned about it. And then I I turned and said to the group in the plane, the world will never be the same. You know, because America suddenly was no longer insulated by the Great Ocean. I got to Washington and they piled me out of the plane, tossed the Kevlar coat on me, and they headed for the what we call it the alternative site. You know, there's a movie about this stuff now the way. The uh, survivor, designated survivor or something. I've been that, but fortunately nothing happened. Uh, but I was hit, and you, you couldn't get out of Washington with any alacrity, any speed. There were people jogging down the road as fast as we were going. So I told my guys to cross the, cross the media and drive back into town. We started to remediate the things. Yet. So I went to SIOP, which is a Strategic Information Operations Center, uh, in the FBI, where you have this sort of way of assembling information, getting up on screens and trying to digest it. Our first deal was to land airplanes. We didn't know how many other airplanes might be weaponized. In other words, might be under control. And we had some little anomalies that made things tough. One of those things was, uh, if you're a pilot, you what you call squawk a certain code. 
it identifies your blip on the radar. It tells people that that's that one. And we had people who are, I think were sloppy about dialing in their codes. That we didn't know whether they were squawking the wrong code to alert us. But, so our view was to get planes out of the air. So we did that. And for planes that had passed the point of no return or coming across the pond, we, we did that in both directions. The Canadians were spectacular friends at this time. We, met, we, we landed a bunch of planes in Canada, places where there's no public facilities like hotels and motels, and people flew up in their homes and took, let people come in. It was just a wonderful thing. And then I began immediately to try and figure out, we, we learned very early who these people were, and that they were from terrorist sponsoring jurisdictions and states and what they're doing. So my first deal was to try and send what I called at the time noise in the system to signal that hey, anybody else is thinking about doing some more of this stuff, this would be a bad time because it's, it's crawling with enforcement people. So I sent about 9,000, I think maybe that's right, maybe not that many, that's, I think that's the number of interviews we did. We did interviews with a lot of people to, in the community of people that were from countries and nations that had been ter identified as terror sponsors. Then we assembled, in that first week, we assembled what became later known as the Patriot Act, which was basically a, a set of enforcement capacities that existed for organized crime and other things, but had never been authorized for use in terrorist investigations. And uh, we did some other things that were designed to inhibit the ability of terrorists to use our banking system and to finance terror. Uh, in banks and then use the system in the United States. Those are the first things that we did. Uh, I, and we prayed mightily that God would give us time and grace to find and detect and disrupt other plots, which we thankfully have been able to do. And I really think it was important that we made a robust response. The president did, and we have spent most of our time, as we it's cost us, but we, we fought them over there instead of fighting them over here, which to me is it's a choice I, I really endorse. Going, going, gone. Thank you. I don't know if I feel like I've been to church or to a rally, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. That was, I can assure you, we'll all be thinking uh, about what you talked about tonight. When I go to speeches and talks, I, I hope to get a nugget or two from the whole speech. I feel like I'm in the jewelry store tonight. That was uh, fantastic, so thank you, sir. That concludes our program. Thank you all for coming out to, to North Arkansas College. Uh, Please continue to support the college and we'll continue to support our community. Thank you. Thank you.